Welcome to Chapter 7, folks, and guess what? We've done the heavy lifting when it comes to stocks. We've gone through and discussed many of the characteristics of stocks and stock markets and the indices. We've discussed valuation techniques, and ratio analysis, dividend discount models, price ratio models. And now we're going to have a little fun with silliness <laughs> and discuss stock price behavior and market efficiency. And it gets even sillier in Chapter 8. A better name for this chapter might be, Can You Beat the Market? Can you? Well, some people think they can, and, and there are some people who can. But most people wind up finding out that they really can't. And there are many reasons why. We have a wonderful quote here by Sir Isaac Newton. Yes, that guy, the force equals mass times acceleration, gravity, apple hitting on the head, calculus, yeah, him. I can calculate the movement of the stars, but not the madness of men. And folks, he learned from personal experience. He lost a ton of money in one of the financial scandals of his day. Yeah, technology changes, but uh, people don't. Slide number two. Random walks and efficient markets. Huh? Random walks. The random walk hypothesis states that the theory, it's a theory that states that the stock price movements on the markets are unpredictable. Well, in the short term, this is absolutely true. In the short term, there has never been a reliable methods. There's lots of methods, but none of them have been reliable, given statistically significant uh, tests to uh, predict the short-term behavior of the market. No one's been able to do it. One company in the 1990s was supposedly able to do it, long-term capital management, and they failed miserably and almost brought down the market. So in the short term, stock price movements are unpredictable. They are random. <clears throat> but in the long term, folks, no. You look at the long term over the span of modern financial history, and we usually often use the 1910s and 1920s. And why is that? There's some technological um, reasons for that. But we won't get into those. No, stock prices have not been unpredictable. As the world economy, the global economy, continues to grow and more and more people are taken out of poverty, this I forget it what it was, 20% of people live on a dollar a day or less in the, in the, in the world, and then is it 40% live on $2 a day or less? Yeah, until that changes, folks, <laughs> we've got a long way to go. <clears throat> So, no, in the long term, stock prices are not unpredictable. As the global economy uh, uh, grows, stocks, the companies that represented, are represented by the stocks, should do well. You know, capitalism is you know, it's not perfect. It's possibly the worst possible system for delivering goods and services to, an, to a country, to, an, to a population, to an economy. Except for all the others. <laughs> how's, all that, how's all that sugar cane doing for you, Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, Fidel? Oh, not so. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, Mr. Uh, Chavez, how's that, how's that bank nationalization? Work? Oh, not great. Okay. So, yeah. So, we have to work to make capitalism better or come up with something better. Good luck. Uh, efficient market hypothesis. <clears throat> the market... An efficient market is a market in which securities reflect all possible information quickly and accurately. If there is a large, if there are large numbers of knowledgeable investors who react quickly to new information, security prices will just adjust quickly and accurately. So, so the New York Stock Exchange, the Nasdaq, the large exchanges in Europe and the Far East, Australia, and now in the developing markets more and more are efficient markets. There's plenty of investors, plenty of uh, buyers, plenty of sellers. And so the efficient market theorists believe that 
the securities prices right now reflect all possible information and those are the that's the way that's the way it should be right now the prices are the way they should be and there's we've discussed this book before a random walk down wall street he is one of the uh, original professors who worked on this these studies and he does a really good job of skewering <laughs> both sides of the argument he gets he, he gets everybody uh, he likes to insult everybody, just like me. Slide number, th including himself. I mean, he, he, he makes fun of himself and, and the problems that, that the efficient markets have. And we'll do that in the next several slides. Uh, slide number three, the weak effic efficiency hypothesis. Past data on stock prices are of no use in predicting future prices. Well... Um, stock prices do tend to demonstrate momentum, right? They tend to rise more often than they fall, and they tend to move far higher than is usually justified, resulting in a mania or sometimes called a bubble, or they tend to fall far lower than is usually warranted, a crash. And there's a wonderful quote by a very famous economist, John Maynard Keynes, who was um, asked by uh, these... Uh, short-term investors who were shorting stocks meaning they thought that the market was overvalued and he and he and they said you know this is irrational these these people are bidding up these prices irrationally these stocks are overvalued and of course they were losing a tremendous sum of money because they were betting on stocks to go down and stocks were going up and his famous quote is the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent <clears throat> and this is absolutely true i know somebody who was absolutely right about the housing debacle in 2007 and 8, but he was a couple years too soon, and he started betting that the housing market would fall too soon and lost a lot of money. If this theory is true, <coughs> excuse me, then technical analysis, which we'll cover in the next chapter, is useless. Okay? If this theory is true. Now, let's take a look at slide number four. Slide number four, the semi-strong efficiency hypothesis. Wait a minute, the weak, the semi-strong? Yeah, they, they were borrowing from the physics uh, 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 physics theorists who were using the strong, the semi-strong, the weak theories. Um, abnormally large profits cannot be consistently earned using publicly available information what does that mean well in other words no amount of analysis that you do to determine the future price of a stock will help you beat the market so in other words they're saying all the stuff we did in chapter 6 chapter 17 chapter 7 if you have the old book the, the version 3 the edition 3 that's useless but, but wait a minute, whoa, 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 wait There are many, many investors who have beaten the market, uh, some famous, some you know, unknown. We will look at them later. What does the market say about those investors, huh? I mean, it's got a problem here. The, 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 the theory is saying that you can't beat the market, but there are people who are beating the market. So the theory has to come up with, you know, some way to address the reality and what they say is oh these people are just lucky huh lucky well I don't think so folks uh, if you do the statistics some of these people have been doing this for decades no nah, it's not luck what they're saying is say you take 10,000 investors and you graph the results. Well, one of them out of the 10,000 is going to do really, really well, and one of them is going to do horribly, or, you know, the, the, the bell curve we talked about. Well, that's that may be true in the short term, but not in the long term. The, the, the probability of being lucky for 15, 20 years in a row is just, it's just not, it, it's not there. It, it, it might happen every 217,000 years, but 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 it's, it, there's many many people who do beat the market. And what I like to think of is a, an analogy that we talked about way back when we were discussing, you know, whether you're a speculator or whether you're an investor. It reminds me of the quote that is attributed to many different golfers. If you type in the quote into any search engine, you will see that lots of different golfers are are, uh, are attributed to this uh, 
quote, he did really, really well and beat everybody else and made a ton of money and was very famous. And one reporter was asking him, was interviewing him and said, you know, you are really lucky out there today. And the golfer said, yep, you're absolutely right. And the funny thing is, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Exactly. <laughs> Can you hit that little white ball into a little hole 420 yards down the fairway? Can you hit that that uh, 97 mile hour fastball and then the pitcher throws you a change up. Yeah, if you can, <laughs> but there's not a whole lot of people who can do it. And we'll just, we'll take a look at some of the very famous ones uh, later on in this presentation. Slide number five, the strong efficiency hypothesis. No amount of information, public or private, allows investors to earn abnormally large profits consistently. Huh? No, 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 no. One insider information trade can make you rich overnight. If you don't get caught, that is. This is obviously false. If you had what the government calls material non-public information, we call it insider information, but the legal term is material non-public information if you had material non-public information about a company you could make a fortune overnight but you could also go to jail <laughs> yeah in other words if you knew a company's uh drug uh, this is a drug development company and you knew tomorrow or two days from now the fda was going to um disapprove was going to say no 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 this drug has to be scrapped it's too dangerous you could literally make a fortune in one day. And how you do that, it's called they're called options, but we'll deal with those later on. If you did that, the SEC hopefully would be all over you. They would see that this person's never bought and sold options and all of a sudden they they take out a huge number of these options and, and it goes up a thousand percent in one day. No 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 that that that's why the SEC is in existence because you're stealing now there are some people who say no we should allow uh, insider trading it shouldn't be illegal it happens anyway so we should I I don't know I'm, I'm not that uh, well informed about the whole system to know whether or not it, uh, that's a valid argument but it's literally theft right you're, you're you're taking advantage of information that the general public doesn't have that was the whole idea behind the fair disclosure regulation we discussed in chapter 17 it's a it's a long debate slide number six the random walk and efficient market theorists are often also major proponents of index funds they point to the fact that many professional money managers simply do not beat the market, especially during bull markets. They tend to do better during bear markets, but during bull markets, the indices usually uh, beat the majority of, mu of money managers, especially mutual fund managers. From 1963 to 1998, the S&P 500 index outperformed general equity mutual funds, you know, the, the average, 22 out of 36 times. These people realize, reason that you are better off accepting close to the market's return with low-cost index funds since their theory tells them that no one can consistently beat the market. Now remember, you're not going to get the market's return. Why? Because the index fund has some, some fees associated with it. Very low, usually, and should be. Does this make sense? You see where they're coming from? In fact, as we said, Mr. Mal Professor Malkiel, who wrote The Random Walk Down Wall Street, was also on the board of Vanguard and helped Vanguard start the index. They weren't the only ones that did it, folks, but they were certainly the most popular. Slide number seven. Why can't many pros beat the averages? Well, it's difficult. As we saw in, in Chapter 4 with mutual funds, many mutual funds have high annual operating expenses and high turnover rates. So you got the annual operating expenses, and if they're high, and then high turnover rates creates more transaction costs, and many mutual fund managers have very short time horizons. Why? Because they know that if they don't perform in 18, 20 months, they're going to be gone. So they have, consequently, a 
very short lifespan. <laughs> but the premises and the casual observations of the efficient market theorists show them to be patently absurd because there are many, many, many money managers who have beaten the market over long periods of time. I showed you many mutual funds that over 50 years have done very, very well. Yeah, and that's what you're going to search in Chapter 7. The more I practice... It reminds me of the uh, interesting story. You might think it's interesting. If, if you don't, I'm, my apologies. But... Now, we humans have only been flying a little over 100 years. Well, we had balloons before that, but I'm flying machines, aeroplanes. And the technology developed fairly quickly. Uh, the engineers you know, figured out what was going on very quickly and then improved upon the technology to the point where it's, it's the safest form of travel. It's even safer than walking across the country. Um... <laughs> But for many decades, the aerospace engineers looked at a bumblebee, not a honeybee, but a bumblebee, and said, that thing can't fly. Our theories tell us that that thing can't fly. I'm glad they never told the bumblebees. <laughs> so obviously there's something wrong with the theory, right? Uh, if It wasn't until the 1990s that they finally figured out what the bumblebees were doing to overcome the... Uh, constraints that we believed that they would keep them from flying. So it's the same thing true with these people. Don't tell these people they can't beat the market. They're doing it. Plus, folks, let's ask this question. If markets are efficient and rational, if they are, which I don't believe they are because we're humans, we're not rational, and, and, and we're sometimes efficient but not always efficient, if markets are rational and efficient, how do you explain manias, bubbles, Occasionally, investors get caught up in what are called manias, also called bubbles. And it happens, that's what the history of capitalism is. It's a history of, of manias and bubbles and then subsequent crashes. The internet bubble of the 1990s was the latest stock mania. Before that, there was the nifty 50 of the early 1970s. These were companies that if you bought them, nothing's going to go wrong. You're going to make a ton of money, and most of them are all gone. You might have heard of Calcomp or Tektronix. You know, those were the, those were the, the technology companies that weren't the only ones. Um, uh, Avon, which has never recovered to its, its high of 1972. Polaroid. Pol Look, they weren't bankrupt in 1998, right? Someone bought the name. I, you know, I just don't, I don't know, folks. I would not want to buy a company whose name rhymes with hemorrhoid. I just wouldn't want to do it. And before that, there was the uh, mania of the 1920s and that resulted in the crash of 1929. What were the, the, uh, the internet stocks, <laughs> the social media stocks of the 1920s? Radio. Radio Corporation of America. You might know it as RCA. Reached two hundred ninety dollars or so, I think, into nineteen twenty nine, and then four years later, it was two dollars. In the eighteen forties, um, there were four hundred railroad firms. Now there's less than a handful of large railroad firms. But the granddaddy of all manias, folks, was the Dutch tulip bulb craze of the early sixteen hundreds. Yes, you heard that right, tulip bulbs. And they didn't start in the Netherlands, folks. <laughs> tulips are, tulip was originally from Turkey, I think. And that was the craze. Tulip bulbs were sold and purchased like any other security. And the prices were bid up to the point where at the main, at the height of the mania, one tulip bulb sold for what today would be worth $1.5 million. Now, when you put a tulip bulb in the ground, what does it do? It does what all life does. It struggles to reproduce. <laughs> and you get a whole lot more little tulip bulbs. Exactly. That, of course, wasn't going to last. And it did eventually crash and burn. And there's two wonderful books that you want to read 
the first one more importantly than the second one, but the second one is extraordinary. Uh, but the first one, extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds, I used that <laughs> word twice, uh, is written in the 1840s, and it still shocks you. It still shocks you. It just it it doesn't tell you why. I mean, we really don't know why. It probably has something to do with our genes and what kept us alive 500,000, 2 million years ago that's still in our genes now. But we are not a rational, as much as we'd like to think we are, we're not a rational species. If we see a whole bunch of people running one, pay, one way, what do we do? We run with them. <laughs> uh, why is that? Well, they believe, we don't know, but what they believe is because the people who didn't run, who said, ooh, look at all those people running that way, they're the ones that got eaten by the tiger. <laughs> right? So they didn't get to pass on their genes, did they? No. Um, so, so this will explain to you how, not why, <clears throat> how it was easy, relatively, for a madman, an evil genius, to turn an entire country into a Nazi Germany. And yes, Jews were inferior. Jews were responsible for all the ills of the world, and we have to kill them. It was able for Soviet Union to become the dictatorship of the proletariat, which would bring about in five years the socialist paradise on earth. Yeah, yeah, how's it working? No, not too good. It was a, we were able to turn a country, a peace, relatively peaceful loving country like the United States, into a war machine against a country that supposedly had weapons of mass destruction. I still look around and people just act like, did we really go to war with Iraq? We invaded them? No, it must have, that couldn't have happened. Yeah, it's amazing. And one of my students said it one wonderfully. He said it really well. He said, it's easier to fool 100 million people than it is to fool one. Uh-huh. The Botany of Desire is another book that I submit to you, but it's really only has a, well, it has some, it has some finance and it has some, um, some good finance but it really is a discussion about plants and how we think we rule the plants but in reality they rule us <laughs> they they get us to plant them they get us to water them and keep their bugs away and and uh, keep the weeds away. <laughs> yeah, yeah who's who's the ruler we or the corn um each time in these manias the phrase was it's a new era it's different this time the old ways of valuing stock are gone. And of course, each time they were wrong. So, so much for rational, efficient markets. Markets are not always rational. Markets stay, can stay irrational far longer than you can stay solvent. Slide number nine. Why do manias occur over and over again? Why haven't investors learned their lesson? By the way, the 2008-2009 crash had was not because of the stock market, folks. It wasn't. It was because of the bond market, specifically the bonds that were tied to mortgages, mortgage-backed securities. We'll deal with them when we get to bonds because all of us believed, and this wasn't the only country that was doing it, um, Spain, the UK, Ireland, Portugal to some extent, all of us believed that housing would never go down. It would just continue to rise. We like to think we're far more sophisticated than those buffoons who spent outrageous amount of money for tulips. We spent outrageous amount of money for two-bedroom condos that were $80,000 in 1998, and now they're $380,000. But don't worry, they'll... Ne don't... Ne yikes. Hmm. Why haven't we learned our lesson? Well, here's one idea. Market manias will happen over and over again because the public is infinitely stupid. <laughs> I love that quote from Leonard Kaplan, president of commodities brokerage firm Prospector Asset Management in Evanston, Illinois. What does Mr. Graham, Benjamin Graham, that's Warren Buffett's teacher, the, he wrote The Intelligent Investor, what does he say about mania? Slide number 10. 
The speculative public is incorrigible. Notice he, he, he qualifies it with the speculative. He doesn't say the whole public, but the speculative public is incorrigible. It will buy anything at any price if there seems to be some action in progress. It will fall for any company identified with franchising, computers, electronics, science, technology, or what have you when the particular fashion is raging. The abuses are so largely the result of the public's own heedlessness and greed. So in other words, he's saying, don't blame Wall Street. I mean, that's like blaming the, the, the drug pusher for your heroin addict, heroin addiction. And he wrote this in the final edition that he wrote before he passed away in 75. So he's talking about 1972. That's when he wrote, when he wrote this. And that's when we talked about CalComp and, electron, and the other electronics companies and the, uh, the companies like, um, like Avon. If you replace franchising computers, etc., with internet and biotechnology, etc., good old Ben could have been writing in 2000 instead of 1972. Today, what are the buzzwords? Social networking and, and anything to do with China. Yeah, just throw China in the name of the company. And, and yeah, <laughs> slide number 11. <laughs> How do most manias end? Yeah, you guessed it. They invariably end with a crash. Great quote. The bigger the party, the bigger the hangover. <laughs> Look, they're not fun. They're not fun. But the odds are you will live through at least one, probably two, maybe three, because they seem to be happening closer and closer during your investing career. And this is a gentleman who in 1999 was considered absolutely off his rocker. Old-fashioned, fuddy-duddy, all washed up. With this many strong years, I have the concern that there are a vast majority of companies that are significantly overvalued on a long-term basis. This is was John Lovelace, who just passed away just a few months ago. August 1999, mutual fund investor with, at the time, a 50 years of experience. He retired and about a year after this, 2001 or so, year and a half after this. Oh, by the way, <laughs> as we said, the 2008-2009 market crash was not caused by a stock market bubble. It was the real estate bubble and the mortgage-backed bonds that were tied to the real estate mortgage. So, yeah, don't blame the stock, even though the stock market, everybody went down in 2008. Slide number 12. Here are the 11 worst days of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And those of you in the in the face-to-face uh, -face class, if you came to the face-to-face -face class, we show a little film called Black Monday and Beyond about the crash of 1987, which was the largest one-day drop, October 19th, 1987. But if you look at October 2, 1929, it happened over two days, you know, basically the same amount, but it, ha it took two days to do it. And then November 1929, and what do you notice? Notice 19, um, um, 2008, I'm sorry, 2008 made it into the, the top 10, but it relatively was, you know, wasn't that big, it's not even 8%, I mean a little, over, a little less than 8%. What do you notice about these days? Look at the number of occurrences of days in the month of October. How many? One, two, three, four, five, six! Six out of eleven! And one of them is in November, early November, which is, you know, pretty, pretty close to October. And notice that they're later October. Now, there have been many different uh, theories, many different uh, speculations about why the majority of um, crashes happen in October. And none of them are very convincing, folks. The one that I think is the most convincing, and there is no way to prove this, is that we have proven once again that we are not rational beings. As much as we'd like to think that we're divorced from the, from the natural world, we're still animals. We're still uh, homo sapien homos who had to fight and claw and scratch our way through survival just like every other species 
we don't remember this because we turn on the light, <laughs> we turn on the heat, we flip a switch, push a button, and we think we have mastery over nature. But no, nature bats laugh. Have you heard that thing? And so what happens at the end of October, beginning of November? Right. We call it the fall for a reason. All the plants die and many of the animals go into hibernation and the winter comes and it's cold and you look around or at least 500 a thousand five thousand years ago you looked around and you realized that hey you know a lot of us aren't going to be around to see the next spring and summer and there's a very good reason folks symbolically why halloween all hallows eve is at the end of october the beginning of november because that's when we commemorated the dead, because we knew some of us are going to be following them. People don't like Halloween anymore. They consider it of the devil. No, it was nothing to do with the devil. It had to do with death. It's the time of death. And so there's no way to prove this, but that's what I believe. And I, I'm not the only one who believes this. It, it makes perfect sense because we are not rational. We are animals. We still have animal behaviors. We run with the crowd, <laughs> trying not to be eaten by the tiger. And for some reason, the fact that we're uh, um, you know, uh, attuned to the natural rhythms of the, uh, of the seasons, fall comes around, and instead of panicking for our lives, we panic for our finances. There's no way of proving that, but that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Slide number 13. Index funds, market indices, manias, and crashes. Does this slide look familiar? Yes, we showed it back in Chapter 4. And now, hopefully, after we've gotten through stocks and you understand what PE is and what the MSCI EFA and the S&P 500 are, now this slide should be um, much more um, informative. It should be much more useful to you. Recall that index funds and exchange traded funds rely on in market indices. And the theory that is promoted by the people who believe you can't beat the market, instead of trying to beat the market, just buy the market, just buy the, the, the index fund or the exchange traded fund, and be happy with the market's return. The problem with that is sometimes an index can become skewed. You like that word skewed? Bent out of shape? Especially when a sector or a region of the world or a region of the economy becomes hot, so to speak. And as we said way back in Chapter 4, the EFA, the Europe, Australia, and the Far East, the market index, the industry that was used for many decades to describe what's going on outside the United States, it's now being replaced by the MSCI All Country World X USA Index. How's that for a mouthful? at the end of the 1980s was fully 60% Japan. So, you know, the other 40% was Europe, which is, by the way, a whole lot bigger than Japan as a, in, in, you know, Europe as a whole, and Australia and other Far East countries. The J Japanese stock market index had a PE of 52, 51.9, and now you understand that that's a pretty darn high PE. If things don't go as well as everybody believes they're going to go, the parachutes had better be very large because you're going to fall really far. Everybody else made up 40% with a PE of only 13. So you bought the EFA index thinking, thinking that you were getting a broad um, diversification of all the companies based outside the United States. And what you were doing is you were concentrating in Japan. Japan then went on to lose, went from 38,000 down to 8,000. What is that? You know, 80 percent. Yeah. Um, the same thing happened in the S&P 500. In March of 2000, the S&P had produced 15 percent returns for 10, 15 years. I'm sorry, 15 years. For 10 years, it was close to 18 percent. And so you thought you're getting this wonderful index, broadly diversified, 500 largest companies based in the United States. And what you were actually doing was buying one third, fully one third of the S&P 500 were companies 
in the information technology. This includes the internet companies and the telecoms and the and all the other startups that were around at the time. eBay with its PE of ten thousand. And the PE was almost 60, 59.2. Everybody else, folks, everybody else, the cars, the energy, the healthcare, the paper products, the materials, the, the groceries, the consumer staples companies, everybody else made up two-thirds with a PE of 19. Now, still pretty high, but not almost 60. And what happened over the next two and a half years the S&P 500 went on to lose almost 50% of its value. The NASDAQ, which measures the information portion, yeah, the tech-heavy NASDAQ went on to lose 80% of its value. So you understand, when people tell you that index funds, oh, yeah, just, just buy the index. You know, nothing is perfect. I'm not trying to knock and, and say you shouldn't buy an index fund. What I'm trying to get you to do is understand that everything has advantages Everything has its disadvantages. And this is one of the problems with index funds. Slide number 14. And we're going to add to this anomalies, silly theories, and oddities. And the fact that these things actually get um, get press time and they're talked about on the, uh, the news shows, the financial news shows, and, and read about on the internet, on magazines just shows you how silly we really are, how irrational. The Monday effect is the best day to buy, or, or is it the best day to sell? I don't know, read about it. The January effect, as goes January, so goes the year. Well, sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not true. The Santa Claus rally that's called the turn of the year effect, what is that supposed to mean? Well, around Christmas, I guess people get in a jovial mood and they typically, the market goes up doesn't always happen. If the market doesn't go up, they say, oh, it, there, people are selling for tax purposes. They're selling to lock in some losses or some gains. Eee. Sell in May and go away. You'll hear people say this. Well, you know, they're absolutely right. It turns out that the market does better from, say, November to March, April, than it does from May to October. And much of that is because September and October are the worst months. But over the long term, folks, it, it, it may be a half a percent or one percent better. It, you, you, you know, again, it, it's statistically significant over the long term, but is it going to change your your um your returns over the long term? Probably not. Why? Because emotions. If you're going to follow these precepts, you're probably going to let your emotions ca ca catch over. Because the last couple of years, it was August. That was the worst month. And September and October actually did okay. So, yeah. yeah. Um, if you sold in May and went away last year in 2011, you actually did pretty well. But other years, you missed out. So, I, I, am, I am not advising that you even try to do these things. But it's up to you. The Super Bowl theory. Oh, this drives me up a wall. Every year, well, the Super Bowl is such a big cultural icon in the United States, so I guess I guess we can be forgiven for attaching it to everything. But supposedly, if the National League or a team that started out in the National League and now is in the American League, I don't know, wins, that means the stock market's going to go up. The American League, if it wins, the stock market goes down. It's actually fairly um, been fairly. Uh, what's the word? Um, Co correspondent it's actually it's actually been true for many not all the time but many tr and and you think well what's the connection have you ever heard of coincidence for uh, about i don't know 12, 12 10 12 years ago somebody figured out that if you play the album from pink floyd called dark side of the moon one of the you know one of the biggest selling albums of all time you started playing that at the same time you started watching The Wizard of Oz. The scenes change at the exact same time as the music. And, and people, 
you know, attributed some kind of, you know, maybe Pink Floyd because Pink that they wrote the album's 1972 and the movies was 39 or something like that. So, so they thought, no, I had, no, you go back and ought to ask the people, the producer, Alan Parsons, you talk to the band members. No, they weren't thinking of that. Have you think about the thousands and thousands of movies and the thousands and thousands of rock albums and other albums? Yeah, it would make sense that two of them somehow would line up just because of coincidence. Hemlines of skirts. You got to love this one. Mini skirts. When hemlines go up, so does the stock market. Well, 1920s, 1960s, hemlines went up. In 1930s and 1970s, long skirts became more popular and the stock market went down. Yeah. And there are many other silly indicators, such as the lipstick indicator, the Boston snow indicator, often called the BS indicator, ha, 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 the hot waitress indicator, and the aspirin count theory. And if you are so inclined, you would like to watch how silly humans can be, do look these up. And lastly, let's take a look at politics and the stock market, right? Poly means many, and ticks are blood-sucking insects. No, no politics. Um, um, which market? I mean, I'm sorry. Which which uh, party, the Republicans or the Democrats? Which one is better for the stock market? Well, you know, the Republicans have done a pretty good job of convincing everybody that they're better for the stock market. But it, the, the the theory it doesn't pan out. <laughs> the the when there have been Republican administrations, the market's actually done worse over the long term. And Democratic administrations, it's done better. Well, is it because the Democrats are better at the economy than the Republicans? No. It, much of it has to do with just bad timing. Um, the crash of 1929, Hoover. The crash of 72, Nixon. The crash of 87, Reagan. The crash of 2002, 2009, the Bush, this, the, the younger. So a lot of it was just, you know, bad luck. And as you know, with all the uh, the the uh, demagoguery and and all the uh, posturing and the like, both parties are fairly similar when it comes to their uh, um, outlook on capitalism and the like. Now, what, the Democrats are definitely more pro-regulation, and there is a special place in hell for people who over-regulate, and many of them are Democrats. But look what happened when during the Bush later Bush years, and look, it started a long time ago. It started during Reagan's time, and, and, and the uh, elder Bush and Clinton were all very much pro-deregulation, and look what we got from that. <laughs> so there's another place in hell for people who don't regulate enough. <laughs> we get the uh, the credit default swaps and all the uh, the picadillos and the insurance and the uh, in Wall Street and and so many of those people are Republicans. So we, there's a lot of blame to go around, folks. Yeah. Slide number four fifteen. All stars of investing. <clears throat> okay, so I added this. This is not from your book, Peter Lynch. You really want to read his book, One Up on Wall Street, folks. It is it's such a it's such a fun, of course, you know, it's me. It's such a fun book to read because you think this guy's going to be some bleeding genius, and he really is. But he's down to earth. He says, "Buy what you know." Look, don't go looking at the new nanotechnology, biotechnology, social network. And maybe you do understand social network better than I do. I, I can't. I'm waiting for that whole internet fad to just blow over. I know it's going to happen. One of these days, the whole thing's going to crash, and everybody's going to go back to writing letters to one another. <clears throat> uh, buy what you know. You wear Nike shoes. Go look at Nike. Maybe it's a good mess. Maybe it's not. You go to Pizza Crap and Taco Smell and Kentucky Fried Rat. Well, go look at Yum Brands. Uh, maybe it's a good investment. Look at that one. Uh, and so make sure you understand the company you invest in. Warren Buffett, uh, we've talked about him quite a bit. Don't buy a stock, buy a company. He puts emphasis on the value of the entire company. In other words, if you could buy all of Federal Express, if you could own Federal Express, which, you know, you need several <laughs> billion dollars to do, tens of billions of dollars to do so, but if you could and you would buy it, great, go ahead and buy 10 shares. You understand? Now, of course, he's big enough, he buys the whole company. Benjamin Graham was Warren Buffett's teacher. He's often called the father of value investing. You're going to read The Intelligent Investor. Write 
Yes, you are. Nod your heads. Yes, I want to, every, every. Come on, you too. Nod. Yes, you going to read this eventually. Read one up on Wall Street first, and then John Templeton, one of the first mutual fund managers, Sir John Templeton, one of the first mutual fund managers to invest globally. Slide number sixteen. And then Mr. Miller, Bill Miller, poor Bill Miller. Do you feel sorry for him? Don't feel too sorry for him. <laughs> He's retiring very rich. He is still, by the end of this year, he will have retired, the fund manager of the Leg Mason Value Trust. And for 15 calendar years in a row, he beat the S&P 500, an unprecedented record. He, it reminds me, again, I, I'm not a big sports fan, but I often use analogies in sports, and I forgive me if you hate sports. You know, Mr. Padre, uh, very famous here. What's his name? Oh, he's a Salvador. Gwyn, Tony Gwynn. Right, Tony Gwynn. He's got a street named after him. Um, and we wish him much success. He has cancer, right? Uh, he's battling cancer right now. We much, wish him much success. Well, he won the batting championship for the major leagues, folks. Seven times? I don't know. Maybe it was more. Maybe it was less. I don't remember. Unbelievable! Do you realize what the competition is? Do you understand how competitive? Same thing here. Nobody's going to beat maybe somebody down, you know, several years from now, but 15 years in a row. And of course, as soon as that, I mean, as that was happening, he became, as far as I'm concerned, unfortunately, because I could not, could not work this way. He became the financial media's megastar. Can you imagine trying to work with people listening to? Every word you say, shining their 10,000 watt spotlight on your back as you're trying to work, I would drive me insane. One of the weird things about putting these presentations on iTunes, I just did it so that people who had Apple iPads and, and iPhones and iPod touches can watch the presentations because they don't support Flash. And so one of the folks at Southwestern who's very... Uh, media savvy said put them on iTunes oh, okay well I'm getting all kinds of reviews and some people like the like the uh, presentations and some people hate them this guy is hard to take boy is he annoying <laughs> hey it's free if you don't don't listen to it all right well that's <laughs> that's one of the things that you have to deal with if you become a very famous mutual fund manager or money manager you're going to get all kinds of people saying horrible things, wonderful things, neutral things about you. What happened, folks, is he did not beat the S&P 500 in the 2006 and then lagged badly in 2007 and 2008. Boy, did he stink up the joint. And this is, you know, people would ask me, well, if you, you know, why don't you invest with Mr. Miller? Why don't you invest with Bill Miller? And I would say, you know, I wish him well. But I really don't like his investing style. He made large bets, as it's often called. His mutual fund had typically 45, 50, 40 stocks. Why do we buy a mutual fund? Right, for diversification. Most mutual funds have 150 or 200 stocks. If your bets do well, yeah, you're going to have a great returns. If they don't do well... Exactly. So he really did not do well in 2006 to 2008. He seemed to redeem himself in 2009 when his, he was up over 40%, which beat the 26% of the S&P 500 that year. But then again, he trailed badly in 2010 and 11. So instead of Leg Mason canning him, which I'm surprised they left them, let him stay there as long as they did. I'm glad they did just because they, they wanted to treat him... Um, you know, treat him well, but usually it's a brutal business. People just, if you don't do well after a few years, after a couple of years, after sometimes 18 months, you're out of there. So they're allowing him to retire. And he, he is in retirement age. He doesn't have to keep working. So don't feel too bad for Mr. Miller, okay? <laughs> Slide number 17. What do all these people have in common? Well, folks, they have courage. To not follow the crowd. Everybody's running that way. What do they do? They go, hmm, <laughs> maybe it's a good idea to run that way. Maybe it's not. Because the conventional wisdom is usually not very wise. And they have what I like to call an eye for unrecognized value. Some people call it a sixth sense. 
In other words, they see value that no one else sees, or they see a you know, bubble forming. They see you know people going uh, gaga over something that's not worth what they believe it's worth, and it's not easy. Gary Kasparov was once asked why he and Anatoly Karpov were the two best chess players in the world. Now, who were these people? In the late 80s, early 90s, they were the two best chess players in the world. One would win the world title, and the next year the other one would beat the other one, and they were fighting back and forth. And it really took its toll on the both of them. They would say, this is grueling. You think chess is not grueling. Oh, yes, it is. It, you, you, uh, read about Mr. Bobby Fischer, one of the world's greatest chess players. The guy went nuts. His answer was astonishingly simple and direct. We attack better than anybody else, and we defend better than anybody else. At <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> he put it, he put it, you know, he said it very simply. In other words, we're the best at what we do. Can you beat somebody in that little game of uh, medieval game of, uh, <laughs> of war? Can you hit that... Um, uh, ball at 95 miles an hour can you uh you know whatever hit that little golf ball down 500 yard 300 whatever it is 320 yards down the fairway par four these people these all-stars of investing they bought the best companies and they avoided the worst companies so you sports fans you know offense is important but in many ways defense is even more important isn't it so slide number 18 Speaking of avoidance, <laughs> as a mutual fund manager, investor, which mostly I am, I am not looking to find the next Peter Lynch or the next Bill Miller or the next Warren Buffett. Oh, no, 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 folks. I am tr looking to avoid the next Charles Stedman. And have you ever heard of Charles Stedman? No, you haven't. Right? There's a reason why you haven't heard of Charles Stedman. He ran his own mutual fund, the Stedman American Industry Fund. He named it after himself. Not a good sign. From December 1959 until his death in late 1997. His cumulative total return during one of the largest or the largest increase of the global economy was minus 42.9%. He lost 40 some percent of his investors' money over 40 years. While the stock market went up, you know, 2,000 or whatever percent or, you know, 20 times or whatever, he would have done much better simply placing his investors' funds into a savings account at a bank. He would have done better putting it in a mattress. I don't know. Maybe he came from the life insurance industry where this is typical. So that's what I'm after. You understand? I'm not so interested in good offense. I mean, I like good offense, but I want good defense. Slide number 19. Mr. Buffett, what does he say about about uh, investing? Be fearful when others are greedy. <laughs> Be greedy when others are fearful. <laughs> and did he uh, take his own advice? Oh, yeah. Throughout the uh, the internet.com bubble, he stayed you know, on the sidelines. Didn't, he, didn't, he said, I don't understand these companies. I'm not investing in them. Throughout the 2000s, he did a little bit, but mostly sat on the sidelines. When the 2008 organic matter hit the ventilating device, he swooped in and bought a ton of GE and a ton of Goldman Sachs. And the Goldman Sachs turned out to be a brilliant move. The GE has worked out for him, but not like the, the Goldman Sachs. Recently, he bought a, a, a big share of Bank of America. His men well, I don't know about that one. His mentor, Benjamin Graham, said it this way. Buy when most people, including experts, are overly optimistic and sell when they are actively Oh, I said it wrong. I'm sorry. Let's try it again. My apologies. Buy when most people, including the experts, are overly pessimistic and sell when they are actively optimistic. You understand? Everybody's running one way. What do you do? You run the other way. <laughs> right? Not easy. It's easier said than done, folks. Slide 20. John Templeton. Sir John Templeton. Pretty good for a, a, a guy from Tennessee, where he originally was from. Bear markets are born of pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. The time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy. Invest when there's blood in the streets, is the old saying, for, but that's from the 1700s. On a similar note, he also said, buy when others are despondently selling and sell when others are avidly buying requires the greatest fortitude 
and pays the greatest reward. Now, did Mr. Did Sir John Templeton uh, follow his own advice? It turns out he did. December 1941, you, you students of history, what will that tell you, right? What happened in December, right? The United States was finally dragged into World War II when the Japanese Imperial Arm, a Navy attacked Pearl Harbor. And, you know, things were still going pretty bad for, for Uncle Joe in, uh, in Soviet Union. <laughs> Herr Hitler was running rampant. He had already taken over all of Europe, gave up on Britain. But, yeah, it didn't look good for the free world. One third of the Pacific fleet was sunk on a single day. What does Mr. Sir John Templeton do? He calls up his broker and says, I want you to buy every company on the New York Stock Exchange that is in bankruptcy. What? <laughs> Would you have that kind of courage? Four years later, Mr. Templeton is a very wealthy man because some of those companies didn't come back, but the ones that did, oh boy, yeah. Would you have that kind of courage? Hmm, hmm. Now, what we're going to do is take a couple of slides and uh, address what are called famous myths and stupid sayings, because this is what you're going to hear from people. It can't go any lower. Oh, yes, it can. It, it can go to zero. Once it goes to zero, it can't go any lower. Until it hits zero. Remember liquidation motors selling at four cents or three cents? It's going to go to zero. Once it hits zero, it can't go any lower. It can't go any higher. Huh? Is there a speed limit? <laughs> a limit? Okay, that's it. $100 a share, that's it. Much has been made about Apple just when it finally hit $500 billion. And some other companies have been there and, and they've subsequently fallen. Oh, yes, it can. If the earnings are continuing to grow, there is no limit to how high the price can go. This is what they kept saying about Procter & Gamble and, and Altria, Pro Philip Morris. It can't go any higher. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Coca-Cola. It's only $3 a share. What can I lose? It doesn't matter how low the price is. The price can go to zero and you can lose all your money. So if someone says it's only 25 cents a share, it's only a dollar a share, what can I lose? You say a dollar. <laughs> you can lose it all. Price is irrelevant. Valuation, market capitalization is the key. It has to come back. Have any of you heard of Penn Central? No. You've heard of Penn Station? Penn Center underneath Madison Square Garden in New York. Yeah, it used to be part of Pennsylvania Railroad, Penn Central. The most spectacular bankruptcy up to its time in 1969. Braniff Airlines, TWA, Kodak. <laughs> Slide number 22. It's always darkest before the dawn. Oh, yeah? Well, sometimes it's always darkest before it's pitch black. When it rebounds to ten dollars, I will sell. Okay, I know what's going on here, right? This is human nature. He bought it at ten dollars. It's now selling for four or three or who knows. He wants to be able to get out at the ten dollar price he paid for it. That way, he can say, "I didn't make a mistake. I broke even." Because we're humans, we don't like to admit that we were. We don't like to admit that we were. Wrong. If you would not buy it at the price it is right now, if it's to sitting at three dollars and you wouldn't buy it, it's time to sell. It's time to move on. And here's what happens to us: we we're wired. We're humans. We're wired to forget unpleasant experiences. Sell the stock, you quickly forget about it. You quickly forget that you lost seven hundred dollars or whatever, however much you lost. You, you'll forget about that. If you hang on to it, stubbornly waiting for it to come back to what you bought it at. Every time you look at the screen or look at your statement or whatever, you're going to be reminded of how stupid you were. You see? Sell. If it goes down 10%, sell. All right. Or 20%. Sometimes people use 20%. You see what they're trying to do here is they're trying to get you to avoid large losses. They're saying it could go down even further, right? So if it, if it starts to go down, set a stop. Remember the, the transaction is stop, stop loss, and have it sell automatically. The problem with this, folks, is that stock prices fluctuate greatly. Even blue chip stocks, even the Procter and Gambles of the world, and 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 the IBMs and the McDonalds of the world, even those companies fluctuate greatly. So if you sold each stock that lost 10%, you would almost always sell your winners along with your losers. And we're going to see in Chapter 7, holding on to your winners is the way most people become very wealthy in stocks. 
it is taking too long. Well, guess what? It does take a long. It doesn't happen overnight. Some people become rich in the stock market overnight, but it's the very, very few take their pub company public. Patience is an investor's most important trait. Besides, folks, it gives you a chance to buy more, right? <laughs> if it skyrockets, oh, well, it's time to sell or it's time to hang on. Slide 23. Look at all the money I've lost. I didn't buy it. Huh? <laughs> Coulda, woulda, shoulda. You did not lose a cent by not buying a stock that did well. Don't fret over it. I missed that one. I'll catch the next one. The next one rarely arrives. Why wait for the next Microsoft? Is the next Microsoft not in the software industry, folks? It's going to be some other thing. you know. So if you're interested in a good software company investment, well, a good investment, not very good software. I'm not a big fan of Microsoft software. But, but buy Microsoft. Because the next industry, there's going to be another Microsoft. It's not going to be Microsoft. It's going to be some other company and whatever new technology comes along. Now, there's the exceptions to this. Remember Home Depot. They, they pioneered the big box, uh, put the uh, little guy uh, hardware, local hardware store out of business. And yet they missed an opportunity to totally dominate. Lowe's came along, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, sometimes it's, the next one does show up. The stock has gone up. I must be a genius. Uh, no. <laughs> Never mistake a bull market for brains is an old Wall Street saying. You know, people... Sometimes you'll hear people say, I got in at 19, uh, you know, uh, 82. What a bad deal that was. Why? Because the market went straight up for several years. I thought I was invincible. Mm -hmm. The market's gone down. I must be an idiot. No, it's just the same thing in reverse. You, you, it might just have nothing to do with you, like 2008 and 9. Nothing to do with you. It has something to do with uh, forces way beyond all of our control. Slide 24. It's different this time. Well, you know, this is actually true. Every day is a new day. It is different every time. But I heard one, someone say, there's an echo. It, it's not that history repeats itself, but there's an echo. You, you know, echoes of the past. It is different every time. But that doesn't mean you should pay an astronomical price for a company that probably will never make a dollar's worth of profit. The internet stocks of the late 1990s. Now, some of them are making money, but... It's a new error. Okay, ditto, when you hear this one, it's time to sell. It's a permanent trend. Wait a minute. A permanent trend? That's an oxymoron. Trends are trends because they're not permanent. Military intelligence, jumbo shrimp, straight curve. Right? Ain't no such thing, folks. Markets move in cycles. Stocks are too risky. You'll hear people say that, especially when they find out that you're investing. They'll go, oh, no, no stocks are too risky. And what you have to do is you have to acknowledge that that there is an element of risk and and say, you know, I understand your concern. But but even with all the shenanigans, all the stupidity, all the uh, you know, the crooks, they still are the best long term financial investment. I should throw the term term in financial investment because there are some people who do very, very well in real estate. We'll get to that long. Long. I should sneak the little word financial investment um, over time and they, they really have beaten on an absolute dollar term real estate but they, we're, we have we, we we don't it's not comparing apples to apples you invest in real estate differently and we'll discuss that later on later on later on slide 25 that's it we're done chapter 7 when we come back we're going to discuss behavioral finance and the psychology of investing. Yeah, that's a big thing now, behavioral finance. And also, we'll take a look at what is called technical analysis. And after that, we're done with stocks. See you next chapter.